Hi, this is Sean from Diamond Talks. Today I wanted to make a video about buying Rolex second hand, particularly sports models. I'm also going to do a giveaway in this video, so stay tuned for the rules on that. So, buying second hand Rolex. I have bought a couple in my time and I've done so much research on this and you probably have too if you're watching this video and I think in terms of buying Rolex it's things that are kind of particular to buying a Rolex and don't really count so much if, you, if you're buying another type of watch. If I look down it means I'm looking at my notes so I'm not being rude. So I'm going to give you five and there's a bonus one, six tips for, for buying second hand Rolex. So first of all the first one is you need to choose what model you want. Um, that's really obvious, but not so much when you think about the cost of some of them. So then you need to think, you know, how much am I willing to compromise on the model that I've decided I wanted? So for example, you might think, okay, I want a Pepsi GMT. I want a 16710 Pepsi GMT. I'll, I'll put a picture up, you'll, you'll know what one looks like anyway. But then you've got to decide, okay, do I have enough money for this? Am I willing to compromise if I see a sub? Or am I definitely going to get a Pepsi GMT? Also, things like, do you want box and papers? Um, will that affect whether I buy it, whether it's got box or papers or not? And, you know, general things like that, how much you're willing to compromise on it. Also, condition. You know, are you willing to compromise on the condition of the watch to get that watch that you want on your wrist? So that's the first thing. Before you go looking, you want to choose what model you want because I know... For me, if I see a watch and I, I, I can't afford that watch and there was one that I was looking for, I'm, I'm, I might, you know, change my mind and perhaps that's fine, you know, if you've got to compromise because these are very expensive things. But also, if you want that watch, that one grail watch, you should buy that one. Secondly, um, buy the seller. This is, you know, completely obvious, I know, but it, it's so, so true, especially when it comes to buying second-hand Rolex because... People know how much people enjoy these things and they know that they're going to make some money out of them. So if you're buying it from someone who's not reputable or someone who's not done their research, who doesn't know the backstory of the watch, if you like, then you, know, you might find yourself wasting a lot of money on this. I think in terms of Rolex, one thing that impresses me about particular sellers is that they give you a lot of information about the watch. So they clearly know what they're doing. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to name drop particular shops and things like that, but one that I've always been impressed with is, is Milton's in Liverpool. It's, a, it's actually a pawn shop, but when you go through the listings for Rolex, it'll say things like, this, this watch does not have a Rolex glass or um, there are small marks on the hands and you know things like that which are being completely honest about the watch but they're also letting you know that for me that seller knows what they're talking about which is so important for these watches because if you don't know the history of it you know how are you going to trust the watch how are you going to know where it's come from and how are you going to trust your money and are you going to put your money into that watch especially when we're considering that for example a Pepsi GMT might have cost 3000 when it was bought now it might be 10 or 11 or 12 so you know that's a big jump in price and it's something that you've got to really think about it's it's often even more than buying a car you need to know the history of this watch maybe not quite so much as buying a car but you, you get what I'm trying to say um thirdly the price um, you need to do your research. So Rolex models have a market value, if you like, and there's a big kind of discrepancy between those two values. It might be, you know, from eight to ten, or from ten to fifteen, or from fifteen to twenty. And you need to know when you're being ripped off and when you're not, basically, because I have got to the stage now when. If I see a Rolex watch in, in the window of a shop, I can tell if it's overpriced or not. But if you are a bit more naive about it or if you don't know as much about that, you might go and buy it and I've spent a thousand quid, two thousand quid over the odds. Um, so that, that's something really to bear in mind. Obviously, you know, if you go to Watch Finder, you'll know Watch Finder, the biggest, the UK's biggest second hand watch dealer, you'll pay a premium for that. 
I'm not sure if it means that the watches that you buy from them are better, but you know you need to be aware that sometimes, particularly with Rolex, they might be overpriced, and you need to know that. Um, yeah, so that's number three. Number four, and I think possibly this is the most important thing, is you need to know your stuff about that particular model. Okay, so with Rolex, and, and I think this is, it's probably not particular to Rolex, but particularly important for a Rolex watch. You've got a bunch of things that you've got to look out for that will tell you that every part of that watch is original to the watch, that you're buying a watch that is completely original and legit, you're not buying a fake. I mean, chances are you will not be buying a fake, but what you might be buying is something that's been adulterated, shall we say, over the years and, and, and things like that. So, um, dial combinations, you may or may not know this already, but in particular, you're looking out for tritium, um, Luminova and Super Luminova. So if you, if you buy a watch from, for example, 1999, a Rolex Submariner from 1999, chances are that will have a Swiss only dial in that it will only say Swiss at six o'clock on the dial. That's because around that time, Rolex stopped using tritium and started using Luminova. Then they subsequently transitioned to Super Luminova in around 1999. So you will know that if that watch has only Swiss on the dial and it was made in 1999, that that dial is correct. If you buy a 1982 Submariner with Swiss on the dial, chances are it's a service dial, which is fine, but it might reduce the originality, thus the value of the watch. So you need to be aware of things like that. Also, you know, look at the look at the codes on the watch. Up until quite recently when Rolex started using random serial numbers, so you can't tell what um, date the watch was made on, what year the watch was made in. You could tell what year the watch was made in, what year the bracelet was made in, what year the clasp was made in. So in other words, you could match up the clasp and the bracelet to the watch to see if they're original to the watch. Um, they had a, a letter at the beginning, and you can find that information freely online um, to you know see if it's the bracelet that's original to the watch. Also, another thing that you'll find quite a lot on Rolexes is things like hand replacements. So if you buy, for example, a GMT Master from 1995, the hands, the, the loom on the hands looks a slightly different colour to the rest of the, the, the loom on the dial. Chances are what you've got there is a, a replacement hands. So they've been replaced at service because it was deemed that the hands are in, in poor condition, if you like. That is fine if that's what you want, but obviously that will reduce the value of the watch, reduce the originality of it. If you just go into a shop and you don't know this, you could go, wow, this is an amazing watch, it's a bargain, but it's got replacement hands on it. Some people are fine with that, some people aren't, but it's just something to, to know. Um, and also, the, I think, again, in particular with Rolex, it's, it's very common to have really, really minor, niggly de details that can kind of affect the value and affect whether the, the watch is genuine to its time and, and, and things like that. So even the text on the dial, um, the text on the bezel, things like that. So what you really need to do is do your research on the model that you're buying and make sure um, that everything is original to the watch and things like that. You might not care about that, to be honest. You might just want a nice watch on your wrist, but if you do, it's really good to do your research. Um, number five is look at the condition because that determines what price you're going to pay. You might not mind so much that your watch is scratched or that... Um, you know, the, the, the dial is patinaed, if you like, and things like that. But I think, you know, bear that in mind when you're going to buy a watch because you might want to save a bit of money, um, but you might not want the condition to be bad. And I think, note also that some elements of the condition can be rectified at service. So, for example, um, I was looking to buy a Polar Explorer, um, a 16570, and the the crystal had quite a deep scratch on it. It was it was it was more than a scratch actually. It was a gouge in the in the crystal, but you know really that could have been replaced at service. So the the money that I was saving was actually good value there in that case. But if the watch would have been damaged in other ways, it might not have been. So that's something to bear in mind as well. Finally, six point is before you buy. So you've done all the other steps on this list. You've 
done your research, you looked at the price, you made sure it's good value, you want to do a few things before you buy it. So, see it in the flesh, okay? Because you know, you might get a stylized picture that makes it look all shiny, and in fact it's really not. Um, it's really important to look at it, to try it on, things like that. I mean, even if, just to see that it looks good on you. Uh, speak to the staff. Um, I think it's difficult really because sometimes you go into a jeweler and they do not know what they're talking about. But, you know, find someone who does. Someone in that shop will know um, about this watch. Build a relationship with the, with the dealer. So, you know, if they know you're, you're always looking at their stock, they're going to you know, be more receptive to, you know, maybe cutting you a deal and um, more receptive to let you try things on and, uh, and things like that. And last but not least, try and get a deal. Um, you know, on some watches you are not going to be able to get um, a deal on a, on a Rolex, but you know, you might as well try, you know, I'll give you this for that or will you knock 500 quid off it or, or whatever. So yeah, I mean, tell me what you think of this list. Put in the comments if, if you think there's other things that you need to look out for when buying a used Rolex. I think this might become even more important because they're so difficult to get hold of in the shops and because a lot of people do like the previous generation model. Also, I thought I would do a giveaway because we've got a couple of things that are cluttering up the house. Um, so you might want them and they might go to a better home in that, in that way. Um, so I have uh, a Rolex service pouch. Um, if you've watched my previous video, I have this because I had to send in my watch for warranty repairs and also a copy of A Man In His Watch, which I've read and, you know, I don't like things cluttering up the house. So if you're interested in, in winning these, all I want you to do is obviously subscribe to my channel, and put in the comments, comment either about what's happened in this video, so what do you think of the tips that I've given, have you got any more, or in terms of this, also you could put a comment about if you were putting your story in this book, what watch would be your watch and why. Um, thanks for watching my video. If you like my channel, please subscribe. Everyone helps. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.